Thank you, Steph. And first of all, thank you so much for coming out. It's the evening. Haven't you got anything better to do? I'm really kind of surprised at a gathering like this. So I do really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed for, for being here. And I'll just say a word about Mark Blacksall, um, who I knew when I was a kind of younger scholar uh, doing largely things about rural areas. And um, Mark Blacksall was one of those older people who took an interest in younger people. It was very interesting. Uh, and so he was, he was very sociable, very hospitable to uh, young postgrads and then young lecturers who he came across. And I've learned a lot from him uh, over the years, but I particularly admire him as a character. There are too many academics who are pompous twits <laughs> who, who really don't do that kind of thing. And he wasn't one of those at all, quite the opposite. So it's an absolute honour for me to be presenting a lecture in his name. Uh, and I just want to record that really tonight. Thank you very much. So I want to talk about homelessness uh, and I guess because you're here, you've either been corralled by one person or another to be here or you've got an interest in this as a subject. And what I want to say very uh, upfront about this is that homelessness is one of those topics that uh, is bound to uh, receive different kinds of understandings according to who you are, what experience you have, and how you think about life. For many years, um, homelessness has been the most significant and visually symbolic social problem in the UK, at least since the 1990s. It's the kind of thing where you can kind of say, you know, do we really live in a society that allows people to be homeless? It's one of those kind of litmus test things. Uh, and it's been, you know, very influential, I think, in terms of trying to understand the wider society that we live in. And we started off thinking about how do we deal with such things as a social evil. But it's very interesting that over recent years, welfare debates have taken another kinds of form. And so nowadays, we're kind of talking about economic austerity as being a necessary thing. And that means that we have to cut welfare uh, and in order to cut welfare, we have to tell stories about why we're cutting welfare. So we start to go and label people as being undeserving. Uh, and I think that we live in times where those discourses are a kind of almost natural companion to some of the welfare cutting uh, policies that are now taking place. And so now it seems that it's okay to have a look at so-called undeserving poor subjects and vilify them. It seems okay somehow that we can set certain people aside uh, and say it's okay to exclude these people from public welfare because they're less deserving than others. Uh, and and you know, we will take different views on this depending on how you come at it ethically and politically. Uh, but some of these kind of issues I think are the real touchstone of our times. And I really do believe that the way in which we respond to this, which I believe is now becoming like a crisis, more than a crisis, will be a marker of the kind of society that we have. And of course, it's not only the so-called deserving people that are now being hit. Those of you who follow politics will know that you know, the big furore over cutting um, tax credits is going to, you know, well, you know, the whole point of it, it was going to cut uh, uh, from people who were working, who were the strivers and not the so-called shirkers. So we're really in interesting times. Really, really interesting times. Uh, and um, I think these issues are just of paramount importance. Homelessness used to be the thing that, that, that personified this. And you could say that... Um, Starting from the 1990s onwards, lots was done about that and numbers such as we can tell because measuring this kind of thing is so difficult began to fall and it felt like homelessness was being responded to. And these days actually what's replaced homelessness as a touchstone of all this is food banks. People now talk about food banks. They talk about what kind of society is it that allows people to go without food, that are so, you know, that uh, are unable to feed themselves. And the impression seems to be sometimes that homelessness has been dealt with. But it's clear to me, and I'm sure to many of you who know about these things tonight, that that is just simply not true. Homelessness 
has not gone away. And indeed, it's growing, and in some cases, growing rapidly again. We are now re-entering a period where homelessness is going to become very visible. So in this lecture, what I want to do is to talk about um, some things that have cropped up along the kind of journey of researching this. And I, I want to credit the people that I've worked with in this. The, the Swept Up Lives project that Steph mentioned was done with John May from Queen Mary, in London, and Sarah Johnson, who now works in Scotland. Uh, and, you know, I'm talking this, but I'm talking words and thoughts and discussions that have been part of that team. I'm also drawing on another project about homelessness in rural areas. A government minister once told me there's no such thing as homelessness in rural areas. And I can, I'm reminded of that old folk song. If you, I'd write the letter, but I couldn't spell and that's all I want to say. It's just... <laughs> the idea that you can dismiss something as not being there, and that's okay, is kind of really rather strange. And also, just recently, with some other colleagues, um, Jenny Barnett, Andy Williams, Stuart Barr, in Exeter, I've been working on homelessness in Exeter. So I'm drawing on those kind of things, and I want to kind of fully acknowledge my co-authors in that. Now, my first uh, 15 years as an academic was in rural Wales. And one or two people in this room tonight who shared part of that journey, and it's lovely to be here with you. Um, there was no homelessness visible in Lampeter, a town of 2,000 people in the middle of Wales, where you have to drive 50 miles to the nearest Sainsbury's uh, and, and so on and so forth. And so I have to say that I was blissfully ignorant of homelessness until I actually moved to the University of Bristol. And the University of Bristol is right downtown, it's right by the main shopping part of Clifton. You can't evade homelessness. You just walk 100 metres down uh, the street from my office and there uh, you meet homeless people face to face. And I have to admit, you know, naive country boy that I was, this really hit me quite hard. This was my first kind of real meeting with the issue. And I think the trouble is that, you know, we're now also familiar with this, that it's, you know, there is a tendency for over-familiarity with the kind of issue. But I well remember that first time when I kind of started to meet people who were sitting on the street, got to know them, started chatting to them. I am a bit like that, sorry. Um, I think you have to be nosy to be a really good researcher. I once um, got off a train at Paddington and went on the circle line to go somewhere or other. And there was this guy standing there and he had a toilet seat round his neck. Ah, uh, okay, this is London, anything goes. I mean, is it, you know, the latest grunge wear or what, what's going on here? So I, I, for two stations, I kind of held back and then I thought, I can't not ask him. So I said, oh, I, hope, I hope you don't mind, you know, can I ask you, why are you wearing a toilet seat round your neck? He said, you've just lost me 200 pounds. He said, I bet my friend that I could go right the way around the circle line. <laughs> Imagine how I felt. <laughs> you need to kind of, you know, and, and the idea of researching homelessness as if people matter. You know, there's a key thing here about, well, okay, so talk to people. Get to know them. Get to know something about this. And with me, there's nothing heroic. It was just that instinct of seeing people on the street in Bristol, getting to know them, getting to know their story. A couple of people I got to know really, really well. <laughs> Uh, and then eventually ended up just doing a bit of work in a night shelter. And, and before I did any academic work in this, it was about that phenomenological encounter. It's how the experience of my life coming alongside other people's lives started to kind of ask questions about what this was all about. And so, it, so you know, what you do as an academic, gradually I started reading. I started reading about why local papers would have a beggar off campaign. What, why? You know, you know, when this was such a kind of, for me, such an, a, 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 such an apparent social evil, why is it that people take these contrary views and want to get rid of people? Uh, and then eventually I started reading some geography. That's always the last place to go in my mind. Um, you know, when you've got nowhere else to go, read some geography. Uh, and then I, I started to kind of try and understand what it was that made this into the subject that it was. And one of my key kind of informants, if you like, in that kind of way, was Lois Takahashi, a wonderful researcher from uh, University of California, Los Angeles, planning department. And um, she has written about 
What it is about homeless people that we find so disturbing? Why is it that we don't just immediately pour out care to such people? Why is it that we kind of other them? Why is it that they become something different, something that you push away rather than embrace, uh, if that's what happens? And she offers three kinds of reasons. First of all, she says, it's the fact that homeless people invoke a kind of fear because they've been deserted by or have turned their back on friends and family. The fear comes from some kind of social disaffiliation. Uh, and homeless people are not settled, they're mobile, they're the ultimate strangers in some ways. They come from somewhere else and they may hold different values to us and that's very disturbing. Very interesting work that she did on that. Secondly, she says, it's because they're unproductive economically. And because people, homeless people are mostly unemployed, uh, they're kind of um, economically unproductive and people will begin to see them as an economic burden. And our society places so much emphasis on economic activity as being the kind of touchstone of whether someone's worth something or not, that actually um, it's no surprise that homeless people become socially marginalised. They're a reminder of economic failure, a reminder to local politicians and business leaders, uh, and they can't really risk admitting to this possibility of failure because we're in a world where we compete. We compete for shoppers, we compete for tourists, we compete for investment. We can't have this other thing going on, spoiling uh, our, uh, you know, our competitive edge in those kinds of things. And thirdly, she says, homeless people disturb taken for granted norms about body aesthetics and behaviour. They do the rest of the things that the rest of us do, but they do it at the wrong places at the wrong times. And they have little choice sometimes but to eat, sleep, relieve themselves in places, including on the street, um, doing private things in public. And that comes across as something which is a social dis-ease. And then we're very kind of, you know, we are put out by that. It disrupts our taken for granted norms about sociability, uh, about economic well-being and about personal aesthetics. And so in that way, it's quite easy to see how homeless people become portrayed as this kind of other, this really difficult set of people. Um, and they're out of place in a lots of places that we like to be in. Uh, and, and the media, of course, will exaggerate this picture. This is one of my, uh, can you have a favorite quote that you hate the most? I think, I'll, I'll, you know, so this is my favorite quote to hate from the, the Evening Standard in London. And it sort of paints a picture of homeless people, but you can see the words that it uses. You know, a vision of hell, people living a feral existence, a scene of degradation, a hovel, a sickening scene of squalor. And what they're describing is people sleeping rough. But what they're doing in mediating that is creating a geography. It constructs a geography of homelessness. And I have to tell you that for whatever reason, and I'm, you know, this is not, again, it's not heroic response to this. That's not the kind of geography that I want to do. In fact, I want to kind of undermine that kind of geography. I want to see how else we can go about it. I can't live with it politically, emotionally, ethically, uh, as a, a kind of, a, you know, I'd want to bring Christian attitudes to this as well, and I'll explain that later. So I wanted to explore how we might do other geographies of homelessness other than this kind of casting aside, this feral group of other people that we need to kind of put somewhere so that they can be hidden away. So I started to read some other things. I read um, some of the more orthodox geographies of homelessness coming out of America, people like Don Mitchell from Syracuse and the late and much um, missed Neil Smith from the University of New York, City University of New York. And their work seemed to say what we need to know about homelessness is the ways in which society kind of does this act of excluding them from the city. Their emphasis was on how society hates these people. It excludes them. Uh, and so uh, their work in these books and elsewhere talks about how city regulators um, help to secure an attractive local environment by leaving no room for homeless people whose presence is undermining any kind of representation of an attractive city. And so they talk about the response that society gives to homeless people uh, in two kinds of forms. One, 
uh, a, a series of measures that make it difficult for homeless people to survive on the streets. And if all else fails, to forcibly remove them from those streets, especially from prime public spaces. So all over cities in America and in Europe, including the UK, suddenly you saw uh, things being redesigned uh, to purposefully exclude homeless people. Sometimes it's quite subtle, sometimes it's not so. Mike Davis, a, a very famous US urban geographer, talks about the emergence of defensive architecture. You know, so that when you've got a bench, make sure that you put a whole lot of armrests along it so no one can lie down. You can't use that bench for sleeping. You can't doss out on that bench. Um, and those kind of things, automated water sprinklers in key sites to make sure that if someone is sleeping roughly in those sites, they get drenched in the middle of the night, and so on, and so on, and so on. We defend our cities through those kinds of things. And also m rather more aggressive strategies. In the US, anti-camping bylaws are used to, to physically remove homeless people from various sites. In the UK, we're not like that, are we? Only we do have no drinking zones, and we do have, we use ASBO legislation in something of the same kind of way. And then in places like Westminster and Bath and some others, we go zero tolerance with homeless people. We won't tolerate them we, because of this kind of presence that they bring uh, to that kind of area. Now, of course, in America, there's also another mechanism, which is to kind of herd people. Uh, hence the title of our book, Swept Up Lives. You herd them into skid rows, which is the only territory in the city where they're allowed to be. And of course, those kind of um, skid rows get to nibbled at the edges by gentrification uh, and so on and so forth. These changes are happening. These changes are part of the fabric of our cities. And this is the kind of orthodox geographies of homelessness uh, that people wrote about and, and, and you know, we taught our students about and so on. But isn't this, I mean, I think it's happening, but isn't it a limited view about what's going on? Isn't it one side of something that there must be other stories? It seems to me sometimes it's very sexy academically to present dystopic visions of the city, to concentrate on the dark stuff, to concentrate on, on bad power relations, to emphasize the pessimistic. What it does is to enable academics to position themselves as the ultimate radical critic. Look at me, I can look at this stuff and tell you what's wrong with it. Uh, it's dystopic. Look at me, I can, I've got observational powers and analytical arsenal that can see through this stuff. Look at me, I can tell you the truth about homelessness. And I think there's a kind of feel to that, that sometimes when you research in these difficult social areas, you get the kind of academic arrogant thing coming out in a weird way um, that sometimes is, isn't necessarily, you know, um, all too positive. Well, there are at least three problems with this kind of account that I've just given you. First of all, it relies too much on the US. And in many, many ways, and particularly I'll come on to talk about the role of faith-based organizations later on, we kind of get pictures from the states which are different from necessarily from the, the context that we work. Uh, so everyone assumes that everywhere's the same, but actually we don't have skid rows in the UK. Um, homelessness can be found in different ways, in isolated squats. Uh, it can be um, a gentle herding of, of people into particular areas of town where the services are. Well, I think we kind of ate in one of those areas earlier on. Um, it can be uh, something rather different. We don't have tents in cities so much, but we have tents in the green areas in and around cities. Uh, and it's not quite the same. Secondly, these accounts have very little to say about homeless people themselves. You almost get the impression uh, that there's something of an undifferentiated mass of people who are just herded, they're grouped somehow, they're not individuals, they don't have agency, and we don't know about how, you know, the tactics that they use. But I wonder ethically, shouldn't we somehow find a way of giving voice to homeless people themselves rather than talking about them in this blocky way? Um, so you should listen to their stories, chart the invented ways in which they respond to these kinds of changes. And thirdly, and, and this is where I'm heading with this, 
Geographical accounts of homelessness almost entirely ignored the continuing efforts of people and organisations to care for homeless people. If we were always told about revanchism, the revenge, the kind of regulatory nastiness that goes on in cities. There was nothing about the other side of that. The fact that organisations and individuals were motivated to care in some kind of way. In fact, usually in academic work, this is just swiped aside. It's a bunch of lily-livered liberals doing their charitable thing. And that's obviously nasty. You know, because academics aren't like that. We don't do that kind of thing. And so there's a really kind of anti-pose towards charity uh, in those kinds of ways. And yet, if you start to look around in a city like Plymouth, I know it's true, it's certainly true in Exeter, there are large numbers of people caring. There is a landscape of care out there which we can't ignore and shouldn't ignore. There are night shelters and hostels and day centres and soup kitchens and so on and so on, provided uh, very often by voluntary organisations. Uh, and far from seeing this as a kind of somehow, uh, I don't know, not worth mentioning or subsuming it in doing the government's work, it seems to me that um, homeless people are actually given welfare, given care by these organisations and there's something that that is something that is really important to understand in these social geographies of the city. Michael Sandel in his book What Memory Can't Buy says that you know the main problem with our society at the moment is that we spend time with people like us. We're in a little social bubble and we spend our time with people who are just like us and he says we're getting less and less and less in common with other kinds of people. And it seems to me that, that one place where we gain a larger sense of in commonness with others is in these places where people care for people who need shelter, people who need food. Where, this is where often middle class, but not, not uh, entirely so by any means, but where volunteers and workers come into contact with other lives and actually find a sense of in commonness that otherwise you can just pass by. And it's really important, I think, in terms of ethics to think about how we can expand the hospitality of who we can become in common with. Uh, and there's something really kind of deep about this. There's a kind of phenomenology here an experience of need that we all need to have before we start painting these dystopic pictures of the feral nature of homeless people. So building on those kind of objectives, what we did was to kind of start to do research that tried to think through the basic contours of a rather different geography of homelessness. One that was shaped by relationships of care rather than attempts to exclude. One that was placed in amongst those spaces of care rather than ubiquitously on the streets. And in caring, maybe what you can start to see is a group of people who are resisting this trend, not just going along with it. Many people will say um, of the organisations who work in this kind of area that they are the handmaidens of the neoliberal state. They're just doing the government's work for it. They are they're building up these kind of dejected subjects who are disempowered by being cared for. What a load of old tosh, honestly. Sorry, is tosh a good enough geographical word? I love it. That's a geography of tosh. There's more than that. There's more than that. This isn't just a bunch of people showing that they are moral and ethical. There's more than that. If you do a kind of, you know, an overnight and a night shelter, you don't do that just to tell your friends that you've done it. This is a real sense of commitment that we're talking about here and that we're beginning to find you know, more and more in the fabric of urban areas. So we um, did all kinds of research. I can talk about this if anyone's interested afterwards. Uh, we used interviews. We used um, auto photography. We gave uh, homeless people cameras and said, take pictures of the places and the people that are precious to you. We did a lot of participant observation. We volunteered for months on end in different kinds of places in the hope that we could get under the skin a little bit uh, of these kinds of spaces of care and the ways in which they work. And just tonight, I haven't got that much time, so I just want to talk a little bit uh, about day centres as one element of that. 
Day centres emerged in the late 70s and early 80s to meet needs that weren't being met by the welfare state in other ways. The vast majority of these are being run by voluntary sector organisations, relying largely on volunteers to supplement the work of a few paid staff. A very significant number of these organisations have roots in either religious or faith-based organisations, and I think there is a kind of distinction there, although you may not want me to say that, um, but, um, and are run by faith-motivated staff and volunteers. So we, we did a lot of work with those organisations in seven different places around uh, the country. We anonymised it, but it's, it's fairly obvious, for, I think, from the work that we've done that uh, one of those places was Bristol, which is where some of the work was based. We, um, we talked a lot to service users. We got alongside them. This is not a simple process, and it's a very difficult process to do ethically. And I can talk about that later. I'm going to skip over that. But this, is, you know, this isn't kind of easy work to do properly. And I think we got a lot of things wrong in that. What do these um, centres provide? Well, it's likely that probably many of you have never been inside one or, or know about it. They provide material resources, free or inexpensive food, clothing and bedding. Many others add uh, more sophisticated services, such as laundries and showers, healthcare, benefits advice, accommodation advice, and so on. But in, if you want to know what happens in these places, it's more than just those material things. Uh, going beyond the material to, to think about, uh, and the, the interviews we did with homeless people are very revealing about that. This is just a couple. I'm not going to show you too many quotes tonight. I could show you hundreds, but just to kind of illustrate some of the things. Something as simple as a shower, having a shower. Remember that homeless people are troubling because they disturb conventional aesthetic codes uh, and um, this guy that we're calling Steve here uh, starts to unload about how important it just is to be able to have somewhere where you can get clean. Talks about being a scruffy bastard. And keeping clean when you're sleeping rough, uh, either on street or uh, in a more hidden way, is a major issue. You'll have noticed that the sorts of places that people might use when they're homeless um, are actually being closed off to them. Home, uh, public toilets used to be places where you could go for a wash. Now they are kind of being closed off. Charged entries in many cases. Libraries used to be a great place to go, but now they're being policed. And if you're spotted as a homeless person going into a library, you know, you've got problems and you'll be ejected in many cases. Shops and restaurants, which used to be places where you could go in to use the loo, now police their facilities against their use by homeless people. Something as simple as taking a shower can make you feel normal again. What an interesting idea. Normal. And you can make arguments uh, like these about the provision of food. Just the same kind of thing. It's not just the food itself. It's actually being able to be accepted for who you are and to go into a, an experience which might be normal. Day centres and, and places like them are much more than a chance for homeless people to refuel. They're an opportunity for company, for conversation, for relationship. Uh, in some ways, you might think of them as a space of refuge. This is a quote from the American homeless activist Mitch Snyder. And he talks about um, the kind of, you know, the, the idea of being homeless is kind of, in, it, it involves kind of thinking what you have to do with your time. And you're not allowed to rest very often. You're moved on all the time, all the time. And you need a place where you can be accepted for who you are. And what uh, Mitch Schneider says is that these kinds of places provide refuge. They provide homeless people an opportunity not only to be still, but simply to be. And to be themselves and to be free from the stigma that is associated with homelessness in so many ways. This is a note from, in fact, one of Sarah's research diaries in um, one of these drop-in centres. And she tells a story about how um, an elderly man comes into this and starts to kind of, you know, kick off. 
And those of you who've, who've been involved in this kind of work will know what that talks about. They're just, you're dealing with uh, people who very often have all kinds of um, dual diagnostic problems of mental illness or addiction or whatever. This is, you know, these aren't straightforward places. And what Sarah describes here is kind of, you know, that this guy who was known and his characteristics were known and so he kicks off and then some of the other guys uh, basically say, excuse me, say, oh, that's okay, you're right, Bob. And that dies down and that he can be himself and be at home in this place. Fascinating. Fascinating, fascinating for me because what we're talking about here is what Hester Parr describes as unusual norms. A place where the norm is to be homeless. To be homeless is not the other, it's not different, it's not excluded. The place is uh, a norm uh, and um, being homeless is a norm. It's obviously very important not to romanticise these kinds of places because they can easily be difficult places, but nevertheless, there's something really culturally, socially, caringly precious about a place where a homeless person can be themselves and be accepted as that. So, who provides these services and why do they do it? What, what's being tapped into here? What is this ethical move to care? Where does it come from? What does it stem from? Well, the vast majority, as I've said, are run by the uh, voluntary sector. There's a wide range of different organisations at work. Uh, and some of those just want to enable homeless people just to be, to provide a space of refuge. Others want to enable homeless people to address their situation. Uh, and maybe um, uh, there are conditions uh, which appear from the outside to be perhaps overpoweringly so, uh, conditions on the use of the centres, if you meet with advisors or if you sign up to drug or alcohol treatment or whatever. Most of them fall between those kinds of things. And that, you know, I'm not hiding the fact that there are big issues here about control, empowerment, disempowerment that have to be worked through when you do this kind of work. Most of them have an ethos, I think, <laughs> that builds upon acceptance. It builds upon a very simple but profound notion that people are accepted for who they are. It builds upon that. Um, this is um, a manager of a, a day centre in Bristol. His name is Paul. He says, you have to build relationships through trust. There's a relational building. There's a trust building. There's a, this, it's part of the DNA of these places. Uh, it's not just a simple act of going in and caring, you build relationships with people. Uh, and um, those kind of things are really very important. Uh, and um, that is so different from the geographies of Mitchell and Smith and others who are talking about quite the opposite. They're talking about revenge and hatred uh, and the kind of nasty regulation. But there's another side in the city. There's a side which says we're going to start building a relationship of trust with people who need help in these kind of things. And it's a shared experience, a shared space where boundaries um, are actually uh, open to um, this kind of thing. And this is somebody else, Alison, we call her. Building a space of care is based upon listening. And just an amazing capacity is to be listened to, particularly when you're having to tell your story to all kinds of officialdom. To go into a place where you're listened to is a really important part of that. Why do people like Alison volunteer? What drives them to this? In our work, we kind of rephrase that question. We asked, um, what is it that drives people to transform what is an ordinary ethics of care, an everyday ethics of care that you you bring to bear with your friends and your family. We all have that, or pretty much everybody has that capacity to care. What takes that everydayness, that everyday ethic of care, and turns it into an extraordinary ethic of care that is exercised in these difficult areas? Exercised with people who are usually shunned by society. And um, the answer, and I, many of you may not want to hear this, but it's a very interesting fact that actually um, probably the majority of people that we spoke to over these seven places, and I think this is empirically held out elsewhere, people are 
the majority of people quote some kind of religious ethic or some kind of faith-based motivation for this. So it's no surprise when you talk to people and you ask them, managers and volunteers, what is it about this? What's driving you to do it? They'll express some kind of faith-based motivation. In this case, uh, Albert saying, I felt God wanted me to do this. Do you know, I, th I think there's something here that we have to grapple with for, for a, a secular academy that's very nervous about talking about religion and faith and doesn't really want to accept that there's anything good coming out of it. Partly, at least, I think, because of these nasty stereotypes that come over the pond from American right-wing republicanism, and we get this idea about what, what the religious looks like, and it looks rather nasty, and it's, it's actually not caring for certain kinds of different groups. It will obvious uh, sometimes be vindictive towards them. But do you know there's a question here that we need to grapple with because it seems empirically that this is out there in pretty much every city that I know. There are bunches of people, not all by any means people who are faith motivated. There are all kinds of other people actively involved in this, but actually that faith thing is one of the major motivations that get people out there. And I'm interested in this quote, uh, which I read the other week. Uh, which I, it, I just love this. Basically, most intellectuals, by their atheism, that is this anti-religious thing, on the cheap, and this is the fault of the church, they've never been faced with a version of Christianity sufficiently radical and challenging for them to actually have to fight to reject it. And I think what is emerging in our cities, right here, right now, is a kind of radical faith-based praxis that actually you do have to fight harder to say, no, I'm not, no, I'm not buying into that. And, um, and to some extent, part of the troops of people who are getting involved in these spaces of care, the fact that they're motivated by their faith, although it might feel alien to many of us, is actually empirically a very interesting thing uh, and something that we might need to do that. Who said that? It was Terry Eagleton. Interestingly, a kind of very critical thinker uh, in these kinds of things, that suddenly there is a waking up of a kind of radical faith that is getting stuck in in the, in the darkest, dirtiest places of our city and doing the work that, that our welfare state has kind of swept away from. Uh, and this is something that we can't just ignore. We can't just swipe it away and say, well, you know, don't believe in that stuff, so I don't believe that this is going on. Very interesting. And I'm not saying... And please don't hear this from me. I'm not saying that these caring ethics are only displayed by religious people. Clearly, that's not the case. But I am kind of saying that there is a kind of interesting set of underlying ethics going on where people who are using their faith in this kind of capacity are finding it easy to work alongside people who aren't religious in this capacity. There's a kind of crossover going on between secular humanitarianism and this kind of faith-based care that I'm describing. And this is uh, something from the Leeds Simon community. Uh, and it seems more and more that when you talk to organisations which are secular in nature, they're willing to kind of uh, articulate something which is in parallel with what they find going on in more religious settings and with religious concepts. That the underlying motivation here is something which is unconditional and which is an expression not only of care, but of love for other individuals. And, and if you like, that the Christian notions of agape and caritas are crossing over with humanitarian notions of that we are not going to allow these people to go uncared for. Uh, and in geography, we're beginning to explore some of that work in terms of the emergence of what we call post-secular spaces. Spaces where the faith-based and the secular are coming together in partnership and, if necessary, setting aside what divides them and actually getting stuck in to deal with some of these ethical issues. And I think it's astonishing how that is being kind of really effective in many parts uh, of the country uh, in terms of what's going on now. And it, it, even um, we found people who were basically saying, we think it's kind of the same thing. There's not actually much difference between secular and Christian workers on this. 
people in the secular world are recognizing the importance of the whole person, and so on and so on. I can answer questions on that later. So while much current writing on homelessness paints a picture of hopelessness and despair, the work that we did began to kind of show spaces um, that are actually f built and founded on uh, a rather more different politics, a politics which is one of hope. Now again, we shouldn't romanticize this. Uh, many of these kinds of organizations rely on threadbare, threadbare resources. They can be volatile, frightening, sometimes violent places. They can be places particularly where women uh, have a really uncomfortable experience. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think they're becoming more volatile over recent years, particularly, I don't know whether it's true in Plymouth, I suspect that it will be, but with the increasing use of, of, of legal highs rather than other kinds of addiction. Legal highs are just a kind of, oh, they're causing so much problem amongst people in Exeter. I know that for a fact. Uh, and um, why we aren't kind of actually looking at that, I don't know. Uh, and so, yes, there are these kind of difficulties. When you talk to people who are staffing and volunteering these places, they're not romantic people. They know the hard edge to this, and yet they're still there. So, how do I begin to kind of wrap this together? I do so from this survey that we did in Exeter. It was just one of those lovely moments. Um, I went into the city council and I said, Paul, we want you to do a questionnaire around the city uh, of all the different uh, wards of the city and um, get people to talk about housing vulnerability. I said, you really want me to go into these middle class areas and, and get questionnaires? They'll be the people who probably answer them most. Uh, do you really want me to do that? Could you please, please let me do something else? And so we set up an online survey and lots of advertising around the city uh, and, and we deliberately set out uh, to all of the kind of welfare facilities in the city of Exeter to get people to kind of tell their real stories, to actually hear the voices of people who are experiencing vulnerability. And Andy Williams uh, it was a, a major part in this, an um, amazing man, now works in... Um, Cardiff University, but an, a real brilliant researcher. Uh, and so we gathered together on this survey uh, about 800 responses from people who were actually experiencing vulnerability. The city Council were gobsmacked. They'd never heard this stuff before. They like questionnaires, and they, this was something completely different. And so in particular, we, we did a lot of work around homelessness facilities in Exeter to find out what the issues were. Now, I don't know whether Plymouth's the same as this, but I suspect it won't be too different, but it would be very interesting to contrast the two. In particular, Exeter is, has this kind of feel of being a thriving, affluent city. People don't really think that homelessness is in place there. They don't think it fits there. And yet, as you can see from this um, uh, Exeter Against Begging campaign, that the revanchist tendencies that I've talked about are certainly still there. But what you have got are a whole set of wonderful agencies who are dealing with um, uh, the, the kind of issue of homelessness in the city of Exeter and providing services, um, some of which are a bit like the ones that I've been describing. And these are the people who know about homeless lives. These are the people who can tell you what's actually going on in terms of what's um, Exeter and its homelessness. And what's going on is this, that there is an increasing prevalence in the city of Exeter of hidden homelessness. People living in insecure and inadequate accommodation, people living in tents, people living in cars, people who are sofa surfing. Numbers are going up, and they're going up markedly. Very difficult to measure, but all of the people who know and are in touch with these people are telling us that this is a problem that is growing again. Partly at least because there's an overheated private rented sector and my employers won't thank me for saying this. In fact, they don't like me saying this, but the University of Exeter is a prime cause of that. Bringing in lots and lots of affluent young people who can afford to pay big rental prices and what that does is to overheat the market and squeeze out people who are on the edge, uh, who are experiencing um, a rent income gap and becoming increasingly at risk. Adding to that, the inability that many people now have to access welfare support because of welfare austerity, 
Add to that the kind of tougher and tougher and tougher benefit sanctions that people are tripping up against all the time. And so therefore they'll be, be kind of you know, getting to a point where they just cannot pay their rent uh, for one reason or another. And what you've got is a city that looks affluent but where you've got people falling between the cracks into homelessness. What's also happening is that there's an increase in the numbers of rough sleepers. You've probably got something equivalent to our street homeless outreach team, the SHOT team, whose job it is to count numbers. They have counted that there has been a 50% increase from last year and that over the last three months, there's been another 50% increase in the numbers that they're counting. This is not something that's going away, it's something that's getting worse. Rough sleepers, are sometimes excluded from these accounts. And everybody in the industry, if I can call it that, is expecting this to rise further because directly of the impacts of austerity welfare. What that means is that there is an increased demand on existing facilities. That people are getting busier and they're having to turn people away. The public spe sector spending cuts are putting pressure on those facilities. Devon County Council will soon be at a point where it's got 50% of its in the income that it had seven years ago. It's lost half of its income. And that's the kind of organisation that has drip-fed um, some money into these local organisations, and they're under pressure. And so what you've got with increasing numbers of homeless people is facilities that are becoming insufficient to meet the demands <laughs> that are placed upon them, and that equals something of a crisis. And certain groups have become left out. Uh, there's a particular crisis in Exeter about women-only hostels and refuge. Uh, and recently there was a withdrawal of funds from the Esther community who used to provide that service. And now there is no place in Exeter where women suffering from domestic violence or needing women-only refuge can go. In fact, um, just recently I was told that people were being shipped up to Barnstable from Exeter, away from their, you know, uh, the, the kind of kith and kin that aren't being violent to them, and so on. There are also big problems, huge problems, in serving homeless people with dual, dual diagnostics, the people who are both addicted and have some kind of mental illness. The capacity to deal with people with mental illness in this situation is just pathetic. I and mean, people are working so hard. I know that, you know, if there's anybody here who works in that area, I know how hard individuals work, but the system isn't dealing with it. There's a lack of all kinds of things that we need. The lack of move-on accommodation. When people go through the facilities of the YMCA or Gabriel House or whatever, they've got nowhere to go once they've uh, kind of done some rehabilitation, once they've got a job even. There's no... Uh, start, they're nowhere to take them. There are barriers, all kinds of barriers to them accessing any kind of private rental. And there is a huge need in the city for soft support, for advocacy, for filling in forms, helping people to understand housing options and so on. I don't know whether that's the picture in Plymouth, but that's the picture that we found in Exeter. Something which seems in many people's discourses to have gone away and it's still there and it's absolutely getting worse. So I guess what I'm saying in this kind of rambling through a collection of thoughts here, that if I were to conclude, it would be around the need to understand homelessness in terms of the lives of the people concerned and not of these rather abstract, dystopic kind of geographies that I mentioned earlier on. And that the best place to start is often via the agencies who are providing these spaces of care and who know these people and uh, to whom these people matter. And we need to pay much, much more attention to the people who are actually on the ground doing this stuff, even if we don't agree with their religion or their politics or whatever. This is one of the very few places where there is in commonness with homeless people in our cities. Secondly, that this kind of relational caring work isn't easily shoved aside. These people aren't doing the government's work for them by and large. Actually, what I think is happening in these places is that there's a developing resistance 
to neoliberal welfare austerity. These are places where people are beginning to ask questions, to become more ethicised and maybe even politicised. Places where the extraordinary ethics are performed. And it may just be that these sites of relational care also help to build new communicative publics in which there's a potential for the people who are staffing them or volunteering in them to start to build new networks of progressive ethics, progressive politics, capable of influencing this, not just at the sticking plaster point, but also of influencing bigger national debates. And if that sounds like an idealistic geography of hope, well, that just happens to be the kind of geography that I like doing. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think that we have thrown our lot in with globalization to such an extent that we don't have another way of doing anything anymore. Globalization has kind of insisted that we deregulate, that we privatize, that we become smaller government, uh, and that the kind of, you know, the options around this whole neoliberal government move you know, are, are, are just not kind of being spoken out. They are perhaps a little bit, but that's always, we're being pushed to the loony left. How does this cope with what, I mean, no, the time with what I'm saying? Globalization is doing two things, I think. One is what I've been describing. It is producing victims of austerity. Uh, and by and large, I see homeless people and others. I see people who are the working poor. I see people who are on benefits are often being, you know, uh, and, and we will have different political views about this, but I see globalization flowing through welfare austerity and producing those kind of victims. Globalization has also, because of global geopolitics and playing around with violence in other countries uh, as, and, and, and producing hot spots of violence and, and turbulence which is, is you know, causing these mass movements of people. Oversimplified, there are all kinds of criminalities involved in the, you know, the trafficking of people and so on and so forth. So, so in some ways, I see homeless people and people like them and uh, many of the people who are currently migrants and looking for asylum, uh, I see them both as sets of victims of globalization and of neoliberal governments. Now, you, you're, in your question, you're saying that we don't seem to have an answer for that. And I don't think we have. Um, but I was very struck by, uh, uh, I was watching Question Time a few weeks back. And um, there were... You know, all, most of the panelists were saying, oh, we have to restrict this. It's really, you know, we, you know, we can't do this. We can't, we can't take people in and, and so on and so forth. And one person said, actually, I think we should care for these people. Astonishing silence in that, that question time. I think we should care for these people. And I guess what I'm saying is that the kind of ethics that are being displayed by organisations in and around homelessness and other things, the same kind of ethical response can also be generated for asylum seekers. And I'm very well aware in some of the circles that I move that there are many people who are willing to do that. Just read in the papers this week about how people in the Isle of Butte are welcoming 100 people from Syria. Well, I don't think it's just the Isle of Butte. I don't think everybody is in this kind of political frame of mind that's saying, here they come, taking our jobs, taking their houses. Actually, I think a whole load of people are saying, yes, I think we should care. Now, that's not the answer. I know there are big problems around all of this, and I'm not trying to trivialise them, but I think that's the link between the two. Okay, my memory is terrible. Let me just quickly answer that. Okay. I think what we're, we're used to seeing a kind of expectation that people move upwards in housing markets. And the expectation is that eventually, given a bit of a help, you know, being a bit of a help, people will climb the ladder. And I think what we found in Exeter was a whole bunch of people who were actually sliding down that ladder. 
Uh, and so therefore, all of those kind of locations, the becoming vulnerable, the actually vulnerable, the people who are becoming homeless, the people who are actually street homeless or sleeping, all of those are locations in this story. And I think that's really important to say. Thank you. Yeah. So, so my argument about post-secularity is that there's a partnership coming together between secular and faith-based people. Uh, and I see these often as spaces of hope. However, there are two things that we need to say about that. One is there is a dark side of that, that there is a kind of right-wing secularism and a right-wing religious stuff that is coming together, particularly in the States, but not only in the States, that I think is very anti-libertarian and which is, is judgmental and horrible and I don't like it. So, so post-secularity has my hopeful light side, it also has a dark side to admit that. Now, your question is whether or not these spaces then create big issues about control, about um, either straightforward or subtle proselytization, about the ways in which people are, have religion forced upon them, okay? There are such spaces. I clearly, um, some people are very overt in terms of what they're doing. Our research, we looked into this, you know, nervously because, you know, um, you know, there's a sense in which positionality is important here, uh, and you know, I come from a Christian tradition, and I'm probably that allows me to be more critical of Christians than perhaps some other people are, because if they're not doing a kind of what I see to be a good job, then I'm going to say so. Um, and so our research, there were two. Uh, atheist geographers and me uh, and what we collectively decided was that most of the people that we saw were putting their faith into praxis and it was in the praxis of it that their faith was revealed and not in a kind of preachy proselytizing evangelizing way now I know that there are different shades of that all over the place and it is a potential problem but it wasn't I think something that I can put my hand on my heart and say I think there's a real real problem out there I think people who are involved in this are involved in this kind of real care, love thing, rather than trying to convert all the time, which some people I'm sure will. The answer to that is, is no, but, but um, I'll tell you why. It's, it's not because we thought that that was something that we didn't want to do. But actually, I think it's incredibly difficult to replicate the life of a homeless person in some kind of experimental way. Um, and so I'm generally not in favour of it. I mean, a lot of people do a kind of sleep out for a night to, as a kind of charitable event to raise money, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's to trivialise the life of a homeless people or someone who is experiencing hunger for us to kind of, for a night or for a week, try to replicate it. So ethically, I don't think that that's a good way to conduct research. People who are in that position writing about their own experiences, that's a completely different story. Pe allowing people to tell stories out of their own experience. That's what we've been trying to do. But that's the, the, the kind of simple answer to your question. That's, that's really, really interesting, and it depends on what scale that we're talking about here. Um, so the first thing is, um, and I, this is the way I talk about this to my students in Exeter, many of whom who do you know, who have kind of suddenly got into doing some, some work on this, which is itself a bit interesting. First piece of advice is to actually um, encounter a person as a person. Okay, not as a label, not as a group, not as a, you know, this or that, but see if you can be person to person with someone in this kind of situation. Secondly, that there is a power relation between those of us who are, you know, who have plenty uh, trying to deal with people who don't have. So in all of the work we've done, at least in some kind of significantly symbolic way, we've tried to give something back, either by doing extensive periods of volunteering, or if we're like for the survey that I mentioned in Exeter, what we did was to go and set up you know, breakfast in a particular place. And just so in that context of trying to sort of at least try to be a little bit generous back, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, if there's someone out there that you, you're chatting to, go and take them to a cafe, buy them a cup of coffee, buy them a meal or something like that. And then you might start to kind of get some kind of thing going. Thirdly, lobby like Billio for the changes that we need to see in this country in terms of how the welfare state is being eroded and how we need to deal with addiction 
and mental illness by providing facilities for people, not just casting them out into the depths of despair in terms of these kind of homeless places.